Welcome to the Programming Electronics Academy podcast. Join us every other week as we explore how everyday people are creating extraordinary things in the world. Find us online at programmingelectronics.com. Hello, I hope you're doing fantastic. This is Michael with Programming Electronics Academy, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen in. So, this week we have two awesome guests on the show a father and son duo, duo Greg and Philip Veronin. And what they did is set out to win a competition on Hackster.io, and they decided to compete in the environmental category. And so, like, well, what are we going to do? They, you know, looking around for a while, and they came across this project called Project Feeder Watch, and it's kind of a civic, civic science, you know, citizen science type endeavor. It's been going on since the 80s, where people watch birds at bird feeders over a given period of time, and they, it's like a bird count essentially. And then that data is collected across the nation and, and used in research. Well, anyway, they decided to kind of hack on that idea. And they created a bird feeder that takes pictures of birds, measures the amount of feed used, does temperature, uh, temperature and humidity readings, does all this really cool stuff. It does it with Arduinos and, and Intel Edison and cloud services that you're, you're going to learn about. So a fantastic show. Um, uh, two really um, interesting gentlemen to listen to. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we've got the pleasure of speaking to Greg and Philip Veronin today. Thank you both for being here. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited, as I was just mentioning, about talking about uh, the project you guys work on, um, this really amazing bird feeder Project. I don't even. I'm trying to come with the words. I've been thinking about how do I explain this in words because it, there's so much going on here. Uh, yeah. But before we kind of talk about that project, I would love to learn a little bit about the inspiration um, for it and kind of maybe a little bit of both of your backgrounds and what what got you into this. Um, as far as the project goes, I think the uh, inspiration was um, a large part the competition that Hackster um, put up there. We wanted to have a project that uh, was competing in the environment category and maybe uh, in the early fall one of the uh, Hackster um, members had posted a blog or posted a message on their blog that was talking about hackathon projects that win and um, the kind of projects that you know environment everyone has a temperature and humidity and pressure sensor they put outdoors or something like you know these basic monitors and they said the the projects that win hackathons go beyond that. They kind of are unique or special in some way. So we kind of just put our head together to say, well, we know it has to, we wanted to compete in the environment category. There were three categories, environment, um, home automation, and healthcare. We had some healthcare ideas. We didn't really have any home automation ideas. And uh, I think it was just a walk on the way to the library and we saw uh, at the same time we had seen a um, article in an uh, online um, about the uh, project feeder watch through the uh, Cornell Ornithology Lab, and so we kind of put that idea that we needed something unique that would be environmental and that maybe could help us with the goals of Project Feeder Watch. And um, uh, as far as my background goes, I'm actually a veterinarian. Uh, by training. I work at a university now. I used to work in private practice and um, I don't have a formal background in technology. I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught. Um, well, my dad told me about this idea. I thought it was really good. So we came up with a few ideas to like incorporate like the sensors to see the birds and like to track them and see how much they've been eating over like the, a few days. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm just getting out of eighth grade and like few weeks so well that's awesome I'm I'm really impressed with the project there's a lot of really cool stuff so your your dad kind of shared this this idea with you and you thought it was cool that's awesome yeah. uh, so just so I just so I understand then your your real motivation you guys wanted to take the prize and you guys wanted to win this this hackster IO uh, best project in the environment category yeah we're, we're being very competitive about it so I guess you know, we do have an interest. I, we like nature, and uh, we certainly do like having a bird feeder up and seeing the birds. But um, we really, um, uh, we had, um, I guess, part of it was motivation because we had applied for an earlier contest this summer before we entered this one, and the technology platform was just a little bit beyond what we had time to do. 
and um, it was a it, it was a very it's a very nice platform that we entered this contest in, but um, it really required more of a knowledge of embedded programming versus um, uh, being able to work mainly through the Arduino IDE for this platform. And um, it was it almost wasn't fun. And I, I had said to myself, you know, this is this is my hobby and I like to make it fun. So let's just we're just not going to submit to this contest and we'll look for something um, that's more in line of what we can do in terms of software, hardware, and 3D printing. And then this contest came up, and it just kind of combined a lot of our interest and our desire to get back into um, um, a contest that uh, that we thought we could have a, um, a competitive entry for. Yeah, absolutely. It looks really competitive. I, uh, I'm just so impressed. And, and, you know, you kind of touched on it there, but what I really like about this project is I feel as though you've brought in so many different interesting disciplines into it. I mean, You've used the Arduino, the Arduino programming with the microcontroller. You've used the the uh, Edison. You're using the Bluetooth. You've got the camera set up, and then you're like streaming photos to the web. Um, I just kept it, it, it. I feel like there's like an and a also, and an also. I was like, wow, how cool. So I guess uh, um, maybe if we could take the time to just explain what this project or what this um, what this device does essentially. And um, and maybe just walk us through how, how you built it. I think that would be a great place to start. What do you think? Great. Yeah, super. So uh, basically, uh, we have um, uh, it's a multi-component type of project. So the main component actually sits in a soda bottle. Um, was it a two liter? What did we buy? One two liter? liter. A two liter soda bottle. Soda bottle uh, bird feeders are pretty easy to make. They're pretty common. And um, the main device, uh, Philip designed, um, I'm, I'm not as good with uh, Fusion uh, 360, which is CAD software uh, for 3D printing. Philip designed an enclosure, a circular enclosure that would sit, that would hold our Arduino 101 board, um, which is a variant of the uh, very popular Arduino board, um, inside of a plastic enclosure that sits inside of a soda bottle feeder. Um, the Arduino, the reason we went with the Arduino 101 is I really like the board it's not fully Arduino. It's a totally different processor that's on the board, but it has an onboard Bluetooth capability. So you don't uh, Bluetooth low energy, which is a little bit different than Bluetooth. So it allows um, radio communication. So what I figured was that we could um, implant or embed that whole electronics package in the bird feeder and then have the Bluetooth transmit a signal uh, when a bird was uh, determined to be on the on on the uh, one of the perches, um, the way we do that was uh, we actually experimented with a few different types of sensors, and we found an uh, infrared sensor that um, uh, detects infrared reflection off of an object. Um, the infrared sensor detects a bird on the perch, and then uh, the a board is sent a signal that the bird is on a perch and then it sends a signal into the house. Now in the house we have the Intel Edison and the Intel Edison has both Bluetooth low energy capability and Wi-Fi capability. So once it sends that signal um, into the house to the Edison, the Edison um, says okay uh, there's a, there must be something on the perch um, it's it detected a signal I'm gonna take a picture so there's a webcam attached to the Edison and then uh, once that picture is taken, the software in the Edison um, saves it to an SD card so we have a local data storage. And also because the Edison has Wi-Fi, it sends the uh, picture up to a storage, um, a web storage utility called Cloudinary. Um, in addition, we want, again, we wanted the environmental part of it, so we have a temperature and humidity sensor embedded in the bird feeder. And uh, we came up later on towards the end of the project, we actually fit this in uh, right under the contest deadline. There was a comment on Project Feeder Watch that people were kind of interested in looking at um, um, food consumption. So we decided to look into some ways that we could possibly measure um, food consumption. And we came up with a, a way of a, uh, using a force sensitive resistor. Philip did a lot of work with that because um, I was working on the other things and he was working on that part of it. And he found out that um, if we just had a flat plate, if you will, that sat on top of the force sensitive resistor, we wouldn't get any, um, we wouldn't get uh, effective readings. We really couldn't detect the feed levels. So we finally figured out, we came up with just putting the, we, um, he designed a plate 
that um, has kind of a pyramidal shape that pushes down on that force resistive sensor so it concentrates the force into one area. We found some stuff online that, you know, some physics behind why that worked well. So it also, the Bluetooth uh, low energy is not only used to send the perch signaling, but it's also used to send um, the temperature, humidity, and the feed level data back in. The other, uh, you, uh, the other um, um, cloud service or web service we used was a service called PubNub, and that's a, um, um, a publish subscribe messaging system. So it's, it's fairly real time. I believe they claim four messages per second anywhere in the world. So you can send... Um, you can send messages up to their server and back down. And so what we used that to do is uh, we, um, we wrote some HTML code and gave it the subscription key to our publication service. And um, the pictures that you see on the hackster.io site uh, reflect uh, data that's being sent to the PubNub servers and back down um, to our web page that show the number of times that per each perch, the left and right perch, have been um, uh, um, sat on or perched. And then the food data, temperature, MIDI, and the last three pictures that have been uploaded. Um, so there's a lot of um, not moving parts, but a lot of um, programming parts and a lot of electronic parts um, to make this entire system work. We had really wanted to use a Raspberry Pi because there's so much information for makers about the Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi camera. But uh, very interestingly, uh, we could not get the um, Bluetooth working between the Arduino 101 and the Raspberry Pi. And the one thing about contests is they have deadlines. And so we didn't have an infinite number of uh, days and hours um, to do this. And um, I'm a little bit beyond where I like doing all-nighters uh, in age. So we had, to, um, we had to get it to work. And I had already done a project before, which I had the Edison working with both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth with an Arduino 101, so I knew how to use that. So I think the project probably would have been a little bit more popular, a little bit more interesting to a wider maker community because the, the Edison definitely is out there and it's being used by uh, makers a lot, but of course Raspberry Pi is just massively popular. So a um, lot of moving parts, uh, really took a lot of effort to get them, get them all working together and a lot of late nights, but um, it was well worth it in the end because it really worked very nicely. I think our major difficulties were the infrared sensors were very, very, um, I don't know exactly what the reason was, but we had one infrared sensor working very, very well. And then when we added the second, neither one of them refused to work. So I don't have an oscilloscope, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I was really pulling my hair out. I just tried everything I could. And um, I should have learned, I've learned this lesson a long time ago, but I just went to the website where the device is, uh, it was a Polo U uh, infrared sensor. It's a, it's, they, they package it up and it's sold by several distributors. And the, one of the, one of the um, immediately on the uh, FAQs, one of the questions was, you know, the sensors seem to be acting funny. <laughs> it, it was the exact same problem that we ran into. And they had suggested some uh, um, modifications um, uh, to add a capacitor in between the power supply and um, it worked. Uh, we just followed those instructions. Um, the contest also recommended the use of the Seed Studio kit, which is a kit of sensors uh, that uh, have a special cable to plug into the Arduino. And we found that um, when we used that, it was a later modification in the project, that power supply to the infrared sensor thing disappeared. So perhaps the power supply on the Seed sensor uh, plug-in board is a little bit better than the actual power supply on the Arduino. So other than that and getting the Bluetooth working, those were our major technical challenges and just writing everything and making it all work together. I guess if, if this winds up in the podcast, it'd be very nice. The Cloudinary people were very nice to us because the first time we set the, uh, we set the bird feeder out, we took well over 1,500 pictures of nothing <laughs> and up to the web. And um, although the Cloudinary is very generous in, its, in the number of images that you can store, there, there's a limit to the number of image transformations, and they have very technical specifications for what they consider uploading an image versus transforming. And apparently, however I was using the software to upload it was being considered to transform. And in one day, I blew out my account with them. And um, I thought, oh my, we're never going to... And this was three or four weeks before the contest deadline, and it's a monthly account, so it would not... I wouldn't have... I couldn't have stopped using it and then had the account renew itself because it, it wouldn't have met the contest deadlines. So I emailed their um, 
technical service desk and I said, look, we took all these pictures. Um, and the reason why was there was a, it was a very windy day and uh, the upright that we attached the bird feeder on was within the distance of where the infrared sensor uh. was. So it was doing 360 rotations back and forth and every time it would left and right perch would, would see the upright and hit it and take a picture. So we had a lot of nice pictures of the blue sky and not in a post and nothing else. So, um, so I, I really, I just explained to them, I said, look, here's the situation. And they were very nice. A day or two later, I got an email back that said, oh, we looked at your account. It looks like a one-time spike and we'll, so, um, so that was very kind of them. And, um, and so, uh, that allowed us to continue, continue on with the project. And, um, we corrected that by moving the bird feeder, feeder further out. And, um, the next time we posted out, we made sure it wasn't a windy day and that we were there to monitor how many pictures we were actually taking. So well, that is cool. So it sounds like the project, uh, feeder watch, it really helped you draw up some of the specifications for the project then. Yes, absolutely. Um, so project feeder watch is, a you know, I, it's been going on since I think the late eighties. Uh, and they ask people to, um, you know, every five days take two measurements from an area or two observations from an area over a certain period of time, counting the maximum number of birds that they see in their area or their, their established view um, in that amount of time. So it doesn't exactly match Project Feeder Watch's specifications because we're actually – we. W- if you look back at the pictures, you can kind of make a narrative that these, this is the same bird or this bird is coming back, but that's not exactly what they're looking for. They're looking for the maximum number of species, male and female, um, in a given period of observation separated by five days in your field of view. So I think this doesn't exactly match it, but it was definitely the motivation. We, we wanted to try and make something a little bit more automated um, and um, that would uh, correspond to to the feeder watch. I think in order for this to completely correspond, we'd have to have a wide angle view of the feeder area and um, just continually monitor the area. And, you know, I think one of the things that we were thinking about, which we haven't done, is to use one of the um, uh, picture processing services that applies AI to these pictures so that we could actually automate the identification process. Because then we could actually be more in line with what Project Feed, Feeder Watch actually um, stipulates. And I think another thing that we found was that we're going through batteries pretty quickly. And for an environmental project, that's probably not the most environmentally sound thing. So we recently uh, purchased a solar panel kit from Autofruit. So our next modification to this will be to add a solar panel to see if we can just do away with the batteries altogether on the unit that's outside. Oh, that's neat. That'll be, that'll be a cool integration. And if we do that, we'll add that. Um, we'll add that as a secondary project to the original, or um, an update to our project on Hackster. I like sharing all the stuff on Hackster, um, especially when we run into problems that we solve, because there's always these these times when you run into stuff, and um, you do a web search and someone solved it for you out there, and it's just this feeling of relief when you plug in their code and it works. Yeah, it's like a blessing when people like you're you're. Your web page here is just such a treasure trove of troubleshooting help, you know, because, yeah. you know, like you said, the uh, I, of course, I don't do a ton of searching for Edison stuff. I can't say I've used it, but, right. um, you know, when you're using stuff that's not quite as common to find something like you've written up is just great because you've sure. I feel like you really walked through a lot of the stuff you did um, talking about the code and stuff. So that that is yeah. just fantastic. I know somebody out there is probably like, yes, I found it, you know. I hope so, because I've had a few of those episodes myself, and I've used them. I always try to give those people credit when I do it in a write-up and either cut and paste their text on there with credit or put them in on the actual um, on the actual write-up. You know, it run, we run into that problem with a few of the things we've done with the Arduino 101, um, because what I discovered after after purchasing it was that the uh, microprocessor or, microproce- or microcontrollers, I guess, that are on the Arduino 101 are not the same as what's on a base Arduino. They're not even in the same family. So if there's code that's written out there that's written specifically for that microcontroller, and uh, there's a lot of ways that people can write code specifically for a a microcontroller, it just bombs out. And um, so you can go and buy a bunch of boards from anyone like SparkFun or Autofruit or whoever, and um, 
get some disappointment if it's the, you know, the, everything that I bought from both of those facilities, if it says it works for an Arduino, it works and it works very well and they've got great documentation, but there's no guarantee just because the platform, you know, you can plug it in and it looks the same. There's no guarantee that it'll actually uh, work the same because the, the processes are, are so different. I mean, there's a lot more compatibility than when we got the board a year ago, but um, so when I go out there and this happened just recently to us, we're experimenting with some radio trans, some packet radio transmitters from Autofruit, and um, their code didn't work for the Arduino 101. And it's not advertised to it; it doesn't say that at all. But I thought, you know, maybe it will. And someone on SparkFun had posted code that actually does compile, and what a relief! Because I was, you know, they weren't expensive tra- transceivers, but um, I just I downloaded it and it worked. <laughs> it was, right. I was so happy. <laughs> I mean, I'd be willing to, to read the code and get into the data sheets and stuff, but that's a lot more than what I wanted to do. So, so when it's so, I feel that, you know, if, if you're a maker and, and you do that kind of stuff and you solve problems, especially if you benefited from other people, you, you have this, you have a commitment to share that as well. I mean, you have to do it because and we're not, you know, we're, no, we're not trying to build a bird feeder to compete against Acme Bird Feeder Incorporated, you know, so, right. if, you know, we really want to share that knowledge. Um, because we don't, you know, I don't want, I, I don't want someone else to sit up till three in the morning, um, which we had the one night with some JavaScript problems and uh, find out it was just a change in a library, you know? And yeah. So absolutely. So you, the one Oh one, is it still programmed in the Arduino IDE? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's, that's one of the reasons we liked it. They have a, uh, the Arduino IDE has a board support package for it. And the Arduino IDE is just super. I mean, you just, Basically, just select your board, and and they have a large number of libraries that are that allow you to access all of the ex- the extra functionality like the Bluetooth. There's an um, um, there's a uh, inertial measurement unit accelerometer gyroscope that's built in, and they have packages to access that. So you really don't have to do embedded programming. You can just use the Arduino IDE to program it very conveniently. Where you can run into problems though, if you get a shield. Um, and you plug it in. If the shield says it's for the Arduino, it'll plug in because the form of the Arduino 101 is exactly the same as the Arduino board. But the software may or may not work um, for the um, for the chip that's on the um, <clears throat> that's on the uh, 101. So it, you, you'll get strange errors, like say it'll say AVR something, and right. and then. Or you look in the – and sometimes I've done this. I've just not bought the board because I look at the software and it says, you know, AVR or something. And they're importing code that's specific to the microcontroller that's on the Arduino. Right. That, like I said, all of the – whenever whenever those people say that it works for an Arduino, it works. And, it, it, you know, you don't even have to think about it because they've, they've troubleshot all that stuff before they put it out there for you. But if you put it in the 101, um, it may or may not work. So. Yeah, there's so much to be said about that code environment, that existing code base and – yeah, you know, it's just it's just amazing that you know, it can right. get you up and running so quick. So, what about the Intel Edison? How do you, how do you program that? What IDE do you use? I um I use the Intel XDK for IoT, and um, the reason I use that is it's so I um that is a post that was on Hackster. Uh, um, I bought the Intel Edison. Uh, you know, I have this collection of hardware that I have yet to use, and the Edison was that for quite a while. And then there was this really nice um, tutorial um, online uh, from Hackster, a guy called Vincent Wong. Never met him, but um, I saw his, and it was a very nice step-by-step explanation of how to get the Edison up and running with Intel's own software. So they have an IDE um, that's very, very simple to use once you once you start working with it. And um, I program, I think you can program it in a couple different languages, but I use JavaScript to program uh uh, the Edison. They have a lot of code packages. Uh, co- I'm sorry, code examples. So it makes it very easy to learn how to use JavaScript to program the um, to program the Edison. And it basically downloads right into the Edison. So um, from the um, from your uh, from the IDE, much like you would program the Arduino or an Arduino 101. It's just not the same environment. So did you go into this project knowing any JavaScript, or did you kind of have to learn it along the way? Um, I think if you look at the project, the JavaScript is pretty rudimentary. There's some really arcane stuff in JavaScript that I can't get my head around. Um, but this is so I knew a little bit of JavaScript um, just from being a hobbyist and wanting to play around with it. So yes, a little bit, but not much. That's cool. Um, 
Hey, Philip, I'm just like looking at the uh, the enclosure. It's so cool. I, you did a wonderful job on that. Is it hard to design? Like, how much of the this design is like actually just having it printing and see if it actually fits or not? Is is there a lot of pre-design or post-design? Does that question even make sense? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, well, the, I think the hardest thing about doing that is the measurements because, like, they don't always fit and won't always fit into, like, so in my case it was a bottle, so it won't always fit. So I guess the main problem with that in the beginning, so I, because I didn't really want to waste filament because it's going to be a really big print, so I decided to just get a really exact measurement by, like, taking taking the the wrapper of the bottle and, like, getting getting the circumference of that and like dividing it by pi to get the diameter. So that was the way I got the diameter so I could plug it into Fusion 360. And so I just used that measurement. It just worked, so it wasn't really too many like print and then pr troubleshoot and then print and then troubleshoot. I just got the measurements at first. But with other projects, I really have to do that. And, and like, like 16 tries, I still won't be there, but yeah. That's awesome. Where did you learn to use the uh, CAD software? Um, my dad. Nice. So he shipped me one time, and I really liked it because it was better than SketchUp. Well, in my case, because it was better for designing smaller things. SketchUp is more for like modeling bigger things. So I decided to use that, and it was really interesting. At first, I didn't really like it because I wasn't used to it, and this was a little hard to use. But then I learned out all the components and stuff, and it was really easy. I think he's being a little bit modest when he says I showed him how to use it. I, I upload, I up, I down, well, you down, it kind of runs in the cloud and runs on the computer. I downloaded it, loaded it up and said, here, use this. <laughs> nice. So. Well, that's impressive, Philip. Uh, so, Philip, okay, another question. I love the, like, I, okay, so the force sensitive resistor, you've got it underneath like this plate. And like you said, it's the bottom of the plate is kind of pointed or, you know, triangular-ish or conical, I suppose. And, um, and so the bird feed sits on top of that plate and it's applying pressure downwards. Yeah. And that pressure is what is creating the, the, the is it like a bend or, or the pressure, I guess, in that, in that uh, force-sensitive resistor and that's the analog reading that you're using? Yeah, basically. So when, when the plate presses down, it like the sensor sees, sees how many like little things on it, like come in contact and like, it's like a resistor and like if it's, it senses that. Okay. I'm not exactly sure how it all works, but that's essentially right up on. And, and so then I, I guess that makes, that makes sense. So as the birds are eating the food, the pressure is yeah. reducing and then that reading is going to be different. Yeah. Okay. And how sensitive it, like, I guess I don't know how much birds eat. I have no idea, but it seems like it'd be such a small amount. Is it, do you take this measurement like per bird or is it like over the course of a day and then you measure the difference and then divide that among the number of, you know, times the bird feeder was tripped or how, how does that work? Well, well, I guess birds kind of eat a lot when there's a lot of them, especially during the winter time because they have to stay warm. So we, we would track it for a few hours and actually the bird feed goes down like a lot. You'd be surprised, but it goes down a lot. And so we, we, we take that number and like, we, we see how much it goes down in a day, and that, that'll be how many how much the bird eats. So. Okay, awesome. And do you guys, are, are the when it takes the photo, does it timestamp the photo also? Uh, the uh, Yes, because I think the upload is timestamped. Okay. I don't think I'm collecting the actual, um, you know, I don't think I'm actually collecting the, um, when I send that, um, up, uh, when I actually save it to the SD card, I'm not doing that. I have to look at the JavaScript code again. But I think it, you know, I, we were, I was thinking about that originally. But the timestamp is through the uh, cloud service where we store it. Okay. All right. And um, I'm curious, has the has the feeder watch community, have they kind of seen this, what you guys are up to? Have, have they um, had a if, chance to take a look? If they have, they haven't said anything to us. <laughs> I think so. they're probably jealous. That's my guess because. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and there, you know, there were there was a blog post on Adafruit about it, um, maybe a month or so after we posted it, and it, one of the woman that uh, wrote it wrote the blog post w was involved with bird watching, but I don't know that she's involved with Project Feeder Watch, and I think Make had a short blog post about it as well too, right afterwards. That's neat. 
Um, so, yeah, it's no surprise they'd carry this because it's such a great, it's such a cool project. It, like I said, it brings in so many interesting things. And I have to say, your webcam has taken beautiful photos. Um, oh, thank. You. I, I I wasn't sure what to expect because you know you show the photos towards the end of the post, and yeah. um, but man, when I got to those photos, they look great. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it gives enough. It's far back enough that it kind of gives the context of like you can tell if the bird's leaving or kind of coming to land. Um, yeah. But you can still, you know, I feel like I can pick out a cardinal, and uh, yeah. I'm no bird watcher by any stretch, right. but it's really nice. Thank you. Uh, it was fun because we would, although we did try to be there because we didn't want to bomb out a uh, cloud and area, we would we weren't keeping track actually sitting there and watching through the window. So going and pulling the SD card out or looking online at the uh, Cloudinary service when we had Cloudinary hooked up was kind of like a treasure hunt. And uh, so there were literally within, once the birds know that the feeder's there and what Philip was saying about the food is, we would uh, easily in a space of three or four hours get 2,000 shots. Holy moly. And not, I'm not exaggerating. Um, between 1,700 and 2,000 over three to four hours of kind of just sitting there. So it was a little bit of a treasure hunt. So we, we just went through the SD card and picked out pictures that we really liked and, and put it up there, you know, with the wings spread and that type of stuff. Or we saw some that looked like maybe we weren't sure if one, one bird was trying to pick the food out of the mouth of the other or actually feeding them on purpose. So, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was quite incredible to see. So, so when, when you, you could actually tell the difference in the feeder amount over a few hours because even though one bird might take one seed or two seeds at a time, the collective effect of three or four hours and each, you know, each perching isn't a bird, um, isn't an, in, so there wasn't three or four, th- uh, 2,000 birds perching there, but, you know, they might jump on or off um, or come back and forth. So, but it was, um, it was pretty impressive to see how many pictures we would collect in just a few hours. That is so neat. Um, well, I, I thank you so much, both of you for taking time out of your day to talk and share this project with us. And I'll definitely link to this great article you guys have up on Hackster. Oh, thank Um, you. And, uh, I just, any, uh, any parting thoughts for people out there thinking about, um, working with some of the stuff you mentioned? Yeah, just um, it's go online uh, when you're running into trouble. Google the exact problem you're having. Google it several different ways if you're having problems. Go for it. Go to the websites where there are projects. You know, I, I don't have any relationship with Hackster, but I really like it. I know there's other things like Instructables and Hackaday we've used as well too. And just start working on it. Get go and um, you know, um, we started this uh, electronics adventure probably a year or so ago. And uh, we just keep on learning new stuff all the time. And there's so much information out there. If you want to make this your hobby, um, there's so much good stuff out there. And it's not that expensive. And uh, go for it. Get a creative idea and have fun. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. Philip, any parting thoughts? Um, well, on more of a mechanical aspect, when you're, when you're doing that, always draw first and think outside of the box. Oh, very good. Because when you just start start doing it on Fusion, uh, start uh, drawing on Fusion 360, it's not going to look nice, and you will not it will not fit your project. It will not work. That's awesome. So have a plan, and then go from there. Mm-hmm. I love it. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks again for both your time, and uh, you um, yeah, appreciate it. Thank Our you. Podcast. Once we found out about you, we started listening to them. They're great. Oh, and good. Good. Sites. Absolutely. Thank you very much. It's great effort. Great. Thank you. Well, I wasn't kidding, was I? Pretty cool two folks to talk to. I enjoyed it a lot. I hope you did too. I'll make sure to link to their Hackster I.O. post where they did a really good write-up, a fantastic write-up of the project they worked on. And I tell you, what a great way to spend time with your family, working on a cool project like that. You're both learning stuff and just, uh, just fantastic. I, I applaud both of you. Well, hey, if you enjoyed the show, I would love for you to take time to go into iTunes and give us a five-star review and be like, man, that is so sweet, or, you know, other things you can say. And if you haven't yet, you can also subscribe to the podcast. Well, hey, I hope you have a great week. And uh, even if something's going on that's tough, you know what? You'll make it. There's hope. All right. Take it easy. Bye. Bye. 
This show is produced by Programming Electronics Academy, an online technology education company. We exist to help you create the technology you want in your life. If you are interested in learning more about Arduino, we welcome you to sign up for our free Arduino Crash Course, a 12-part video series with accompanying written lessons designed to teach the basics of programming Arduino. To register for the course, simply text your email address to 440-701-5311, or you can visit programming.com electronics.com and sign up there.